Thank you for being here. It's certainly a pleasure. Gracias por estar aquí. Es un placer. I want to talk to you about overtraining in athletes. Vamos a hablar de sobre entrenamiento en atletas. And please, if you would like copies of the slides, that is not a problem. Y de nuevo, si tienen copias de de lo, de, la, de las diapositivas, no hay problema. You're welcome to contact me through my email or my Twitter account, and I'll gladly send you this. Ahí está su email, su cuenta de Twitter, y bueno, que si le escriben, encantado de enviarlo. So, just a few moments before, let me tell you a little bit about where I'm from and who I am. Entonces, unos minutos, no sabes si estuvieron o no, pero antes de comenzar, le gustaría decir de dónde vienen para quién es. I am from the state of North Carolina in the United States. Desde el estado de Carolina del Norte. And in particular, the University of North Carolina, which is in the center of the state. Y la Universidad de Carolina del Norte que está en el medio del estado. And North Carolina is a southern state in the United States. El Carolina del Norte es un estado del sur de Estados Unidos. And we're known very much for the fact that we have some very beautiful landscapes. We have, to the east, on the Atlantic Ocean, some very beautiful beaches with coastal islands. Very similar to Uruguay. But in the west, we have mountains that go up to 2,000 meters and have plenty of snow in the winter. A little different than Uruguay. <laughs> the University of North Carolina, where I'm from, is the oldest public university in the United States. So we are almost 225 years old. But in the United States, public university does not mean it is free. You have to pay to go to university there. But public universities are far less expensive than the private universities. We have about 25,000 students who are studying for four years for their bachelor's degree. And then we have approximately 5,000 students who are studying for either a two-year master's degree or a four to six-year and we are consistently ranked as one of the top 10 universities in the United States or the top 50 in the world. Here you see our American football stadium. Here you see our track 
We have won our national basketball championships six times, and we were national champions last year for men. Seis, seis años que ganaron el campeonato nacional de básquetbol y el año pasado fue uno de ellos. And our women's football team has won the national championships 18 times. Y el equipo de fútbol femenino ganó el campeonato nacional 18 veces. And many of our women footballers have been on Olympic teams and won Olympic medals. Y muchos de 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 las futbolistas fueron campeones olímpicos, campeones mundiales. And I realize the images are slightly out of focus. I've been told we can't fix that, so I apologize. But I like this photo because that's where my office is, right there at that little window looking out. It's a little hard to see with it out of focus. All right, so my overview and purpose tonight. I want to define for you what is overreaching and overtraining and the overtraining syndrome. I want to talk about what are the signs and symptoms of the overtraining syndrome. What we think causes the overtraining syndrome. And what you, as people who work with athletes and our healthcare providers, can do about it. So I have done research in overtraining for many years. Some of that has been with athletes, but actually far more of it has been with our military soldiers who our government is very interested in becoming, not becoming overtrained. So sometimes I'll talk about training that we might see within athletes, but sometimes I'll talk about training we might see in the military. So what do we mean when we say overreaching, overtraining, overtraining syndrome? You know as people in physical education, that we have to train people to make them more physically fit. And as they become more fit, we have to give them more training, we have to overload them. They adapt, they get better, we overload them again. We would think of that as a normal training progression. Overreaching training is subjecting someone to an overload, but it's more than they can typically tolerate. Overtraining is subjecting them to an overload that is far more than they can tolerate. These terms refer 
pero todos estos nombres en sí es lo mismo, distintas áreas de Shaman. And if you picked up a textbook and you look up overtraining syndrome, y si agarramos un libro y buscamos el síndrome de sobreentrenamiento, you'll probably see a figure very much like this. Y probablemente veamos alguna figura similar a esta que está ahí. You can even pick up one of my books and you'll see a figure very much like this. But let me show you a different version that explains what all these lines are. So if on this axis we have... Format, Okay, acá, mi asistente. Eh, bien, eh, hay una, no sé, la, la gente de Perú, no sé, están pidiendo que hay eh, algún lugar que no se puede comunicar. Eh, me necesitaban el número de, de este o Y ahora, a ver si puedo comunicar. No, no problem. Okay. Let's see. Right. So on this Y axis we have performance. On the X axis we have time, which may be weeks or months. If this is an athlete's normal performance level, we subject them to an overload training, their performance may go down for a short period of time. If we increase the volume of work, the intensity of the work, at first it's hard for them, but they will adapt and then they compensate by having a higher level of performance than when they started. This is what we typically do when we are overloading someone. And if we give them a larger overload in their training, it may be severe, but long as it's not too severe, we may have a super compensation in their performance. That supercompensation may sometimes occur when we subject them to not an overload but an overreaching. But if we've made the overreaching load, that increase in volume, that increase in intensity, too severe, rather than supercompensating, they may actually start to have a decrease in performance. And if they can't recover, then we see this condition of chronic fatigue that is referred to as the overtraining syndrome and their performance is far below where it started and unless we subject them to an intervention it will not come back up. Overreaching 
is a short-term decrement in performance capacity but what you'll find is with adequate rest and recovery there is a restoration of performance to higher levels within a few weeks over training that restoration does not occur and we develop the syndrome that medical condition that is a total result of too much training stress just to show you one more model trying to explain this this is from the European Congress of Sports Science we have someone who is subjected to an overload but it's a normal training they adapt to that overload and we come back to a baseline level of training and we cycle them through another overload we decide that we need to give them a higher overload a supra overload that is overreaching because we're hoping to get that super compensation of performance increase but if we don't know how much that should be and we exceed it then this overreaching is too much for them and it becomes over which leads to them developing the overtraining syndrome keep in mind this is a process that's a product so what are the signs and symptoms that someone would have the overtraining syndrome sports specific decrease in performance disturbed mood states usually athletes will become either very aggressive or very permissive and quiet in their behavior opposite of what they normally are if you give them periods of extra rest this still persists they develop an attitude of not wanting to do their exercise training those types of symptoms would suggest that the overreaching was progressing to overtraining and you were asking too much of them there's lots of things that can trigger this kind of change an imbalance between the training load and the recovery 
monotony of training, doing the exact same training day after day. Too many competitions. Emotional disturbances, lots of life stress. Inadequate sleep. Altitude or heat stress training, which can be very overloading. <coughs> or improper nutrition. It is very seldom one of these things that precipitates this. It is usually several of them coming together. Prevalence. How many athletes have this problem? Obviously, these are statistics from the United States. University swimmers and endurance athletes, so this is typically going to be track and field or cross-country runners. At least 10% on average in any given year are overtrained. When we go to the high level of distance runners that we see in the United States, typically the ones that are professional, almost two thirds of them experience overtraining syndrome. If we talk about average runners in the United States, typically about a third of them have experienced overtraining syndrome. And it's interesting because swimmers seem to have large problems with this. 90% of university swimmers develop overtraining syndrome in their first year at the university. And part of the reason for that is below the age of 18, there are rules and regulations on how much training you are allowed to give children. As soon as you turn 18 and go to the university, all those rules and regulations go away and you're treated like an adult. <laughs> And, and many of the coaches don't remember that as a 17 year old they were not allowed to train that much. <coughs> and again, as I know, you can't really read this because of the focus. This is from an article on overtraining in athletes. And again, if you ask for the slides, you'll be able to read the reference much easier. And one of the things this table tells you from this particular research article is there's two variations on how we see symptoms of overtraining athletes. What we call parasympathetic and sympathetic characteristics. So athletes who are involved in sports that are very endurance, cardiovascular base, tend to have parasympathetic. Entonces, que están, eh, 
tiende a desarrollar el, el, el sobreentrenamiento del tipo parasimpático. They're very fatigued all the time. They tend to be depressed. They have bradycardia, very low heart rate. And a lack of motivation to want to do their exercise. Athletes who are more associated with what we might think of strength and power events tend to have much more of sympathetic alterations. They tend to have lots of sleep disturbances. They tend to have behaviors that are very irritable, very angry. But they tend to have tachycardia, higher heart rates. As well as elevated blood pressure. And they seem to be very restless. Athletes whose training is a mixture of those two, their symptoms can fall to either side. So what's, what's the causality of the overtraining syndrome? So the old answer to that question is this. It's stress, but it's stress totally due to the exercise training load being too great. The new answer changes that slightly. It's still too much stress, but it's not just exercise training stress, but it's life stress too. So you can have an athlete that you are training, you overload them, they respond appropriately, you decide to give them a period of training that's overreaching to try to get a super compensation. They, res they respond appropriately and do have that super compensation and you feel your training is very successful. Pero, <laughs> you could do that exact same training, but if that athlete is having problems, Someone they love very much has died. Someone they love very much has left them. <laughs> they have not enough dinero to do what they want. Suddenly, what was a normal and appropriate training progression is much harder for them and they can't adapt. So that overreaching that worked might not work because now it's gone from overreaching to overtraining. Ahora podría 
This is an important mediator, to use statistical terminology, of the exercise training load. And most of the time when we think about life stress, we tend to think of those negative things <laughs> but sometimes there are very positive things you stress that happen in your life you have a niño <laughs> that can add to the overall impact of the training load too so this life stress includes both those things we consider very positive and negative in our life. Sometimes in doing a presentation like this to people who are not exercisers, who are not into physical education, they might say, well then just do less of that to compensate for that. Most certainly people who are regular exercisers could do that, but many athletes don't have the option of training, removing training stress, because that's how they make their livelihood. The example I would give you again is at my university, many of our athletes are on scholarships so by participating in sport, they don't have to pay for their university education. So they might say to their coach, I'm having a lot of life stress. The training is causing a lot of stress. I would like to take the next six months off to not train as much. And the coach will say, that's fine. You now owe us the $15,000 for going to school that six months. <laughs> That just added a lot more life stress. <laughs> so what can you do as someone who works with athletes to try to help? You need to be aware, you need to look at what your athletes are doing, what they are saying, to make certain you're watching for signs and symptoms. It's important that we try to have some tools that can help you in that process, both psychologically and physiologically. And the physiological tend to be things that we call biomarkers that we might measure in the blood. Relative to psychology, probably the most prevalent tool that's used is the POMS Profile of Mood State Questionnaire. The blue and the red line represent pro POMS profiles of normal, healthy athletes. <laughs> 
rojo y en azul sería como The green line represents the profile of an athlete that has the overtraining syndrome. This particular tool is very good for detecting when people have the syndrome. <coughs> But the problem with that is, as a coach, as a trainer, you want to know before they have the syndrome, because once they have it, their performance is already declining. <laughs> You want something that you can utilize that would that the athlete is moving towards overtraining so that you could intervene in the training program to prevent from becoming overtraining. So, in the area of physiology, a functional biomarker that is predictive of the training becoming inappropriate is what we call the Holy Grail. Physiologists, coaches, athletic trainers, athletes all want something that we could measure in your blood, measure in your saliva, measure in your urine and say, you're training too hard, back off now before you get the syndrome. And if you went into the published research literature and you searched all the experimental studies that have looked at overtraining, you would see all of these different physiological biomarkers suggested as something that is possibly useful as a predictive tool. But part of the problem with the research literature it's not consistent. One study shows that the testosterone to cortisol ratio is very good at indicating when overreaching is moving to overtraining. Another group of researchers says that's wonderful, let's try that and measure that ratio and they get very different results. So we don't have consistency in our findings. And in those studies where we do find biomarkers are consistent, they tend to be very sports specific. This one marathon runners, it tells me nothing in football players. Entonces, 
And again, many coaches, many athletic trainers, they don't want to have to measure different things but depending upon the sport. They want to be able to look at one thing and say, this is good, this is bad relative to training. Now, my area of research is endocrinology. And I have done lots of studies on how hormones respond to different kinds of stress, exercise being one. And perhaps one of the most interesting studies on overtraining biomarkers to me is the work done by Romain Moussan in Belgium. And he has developed a model where you give athletes two exercise bouts in the same day. They basically do a maximal exercise test in the morning, a few hours, and do a maximal exercise test in the afternoon. And again, the slide is hard to see because of the focus. But one of the things they found was the response to the second exercise test in athletes that showed overtraining signs and symptoms was very different than normal healthy athletes. They looked at a variety of hormones to assess this altered second exercise response. And what they found is this. The athletes who showed the signs and symptoms of overtraining with the second exercise bout had a suppression in the release of prolactin and a suppression in the release of the hormone ACTH. The normal healthy athletes that they compared to in the second exercise test were always releasing more of those particular hormones. Now, interesting physiology, interesting science. Not very practical because it's very expensive and time consuming to measure hormones. The other aspect about the study, which I, I recognize why in a moment, I'll explain, is they had to wait till the athletes were already had the overtraining syndrome to display this. <coughs> So they already have the problem you're trying to prevent. But what Dr. Mossan has said is perhaps if you have an athlete who is normally showing this response and they start over time, 
a week later, two weeks later, to show less of a response, that may be an indicative of they are overreaching, going towards overtraining. Again, interesting, but not very practical. So why does this happen? So in doing research, you have ethics review committees. And one of the first rules of the ethics committee is you cannot harm your subjects. So for me to take an athlete and say, I want you to do my research study, and what I really want to do is overtrain you so you develop the overtraining syndrome, your physical well, your performance is going to da go down, your professional make as much money. The ethics committee is going to say, no, you can't do that research. So most of us who do this type of research, what we do is we talk to athletes, we talk to coaches, and when the coach says, I think my athletes has the overtraining syndrome. We capture them, we take them into the lab. We didn't make them overtrain, their coach did, or they did themselves, and we describe what they look like, and then we find people who have done the same type of training, not overtrained, and compare them. For two nights this week, I have lectured on research, design, and statistics. What I just described to you as a way to do research is very poor, low-level science. But ethics prevent us from experimentally developing the kind of study we want. So Dr. Musan suffers the same problem. We can't make someone overtrain. We can only capture them afterwards and describe what they look like. Just a little bit more, and then we'll see if there's questions. So, one of the prevalent theories as to why their performance is going down, why their mood is changing, is referred to as the cytokine theory of overtraining. And this was developed by Dr. Louise Laker-Smith from South Africa. I have met her on several occasions and she is just a wonderful, wonderful person to talk to. <laughs> so basically, her thought process is this. Anytime you do exercise, you cause microtrauma to skeletal muscle cells. This causes a local inflammatory response. <laughs> 
With adequate rest, that inflammation goes away, the muscle is repaired, it's better than it was before. When the physical load of the overreaching is inappropriate and too much, we go from having a small localized inflammation to a large chronic inflammation. And another lecture that I talked about earlier this week said, oh, by the way, one of the things that makes chronic inflammation worse is What happens with this chronic stress is elevations of select cytokines that are pro-inflammatory. <coughs> and these pro-inflammatory cytokines start to develop an immunosuppression. <laughs> And what you find is as you continue to train with overreaching that is inappropriate, you move to a chronic suppression of your immune system, which will start to affect your performance, affect your health. <laughs> Dr. Lakers has said perhaps the key cytokine that is responsible for developing this is the IL-6 cytokine. <laughs> and Dr. Robson Ansley, who had studied with Dr. Laker Smith, says what happens is as we overload and overreach and overtrain, we have higher and higher levels of IL-6 that induce the immunosuppression and lead to chronic fatigue. <laughs> And perhaps one of the nicest research studies to support this point <coughs> Dr. Robson Ansley took a group of healthy distance runners And what she did is make them perform a 10 kilometer race. At the end of the 10 kilometer race, she asked them what their fatigue level was, what their mood state was, to determine how well they had felt about the performance. The first time they did this, she gave them a placebo. They rested, they recovered, they did this event again, but rather than a placebo, she gave them a drug that elevated their IL-6 levels. The running performance time for the 10 kilometers became worse. 
the level of fatigue that they experienced after the race was higher. And their mood state after that IL-6 race was extremely bad. They were very depressed. And again, I realize you cannot read that because of the small print. That's why I was summarizing what the major findings from that particular study. And this is actually a study one of my students did. And we followed young women athletes during a 20-week training cycle. And again, this was designed by their coach. And what you found is every three weeks, the coach increased the overload overreaching. He had 17 athletes he was training. At the end of the 20 weeks, seven of them showed all the signs of the overtraining syndrome. Ten of them did not. And we had measured a variety of blood markers in them before their training and after the 20 weeks. Their performance for the overtrained athletes was severely suppressed. IL-6 was elevated. TNF-alpha, another pro-inflammatory. IL-1 beta cytokine, another pro-inflammatory, elevated. And according to Dr. Laker-Smith's theory, that's exactly the kind of profile we should have seen in But people will always ask the question, is the overreaching, overtraining, causing the immunosuppression? Or perhaps they get immunosuppressed, which is a life stress to them that causes the training to move to overtraining. So in English, we would say, is it the chicken or the egg that came first? Mm -hmm. Overtraining, causing immunosuppression, or they develop an immunosuppression that causes the training to become overtraining. <coughs> Because of the limitations in how we have to structure our research designs, we really can't answer that well. But I can tell you that's one of my chickens. <laughs> Because our tools are so limited in trying to prevent the idea of intervening to help once someone has the overtraining syndrome, it's usually too late. Entonces, 
that athlete may have to take many weeks, many months away from training and competing to get back to normal, which usually means their competitive season is severely compromised. <laughs> so if we can't intervene successfully, can we prevent? Again, here's the reference for this particular list of suggestions for trying to prevent. And I won't read everything because it was, again, please contact me and I'll send you the slide. But at the top of the list is try to introduce a structured periodization in training that incorporates periods of rest and recovery. Try not to overcompete your athlete. Talk to your athlete and find out what's happening in their life that is stressful. And in our case, this for our university athletes is somewhat tr uh, difficult to do. Because our coaches are not allowed to ask certain questions of the athletes. <laughs> And that can be a logistics problem. Other things make certain your athletes are eating enough, they're drinking enough, they're sleeping enough. It doesn't recommend you take blood samples or saliva samples and measure something. But it does suggest you might want to look at POMS questionnaire scores. Or the other one I would recommend that is simpler and easier is the rescue questionnaire. But it really comes down to the coach being observant and being able to really read and understand what their athlete is doing. And in many situations, in talking to the athlete, the athlete's going to tell you what you want to hear as a coach. And again, if I use our university athletes as an example, if you as the athlete tell your coach, I'm really tired, I'm not certain I can do the full training today. The coach might say, that's okay, but you know what? You're not playing in the competition on Saturday because I have other athletes that perhaps are feeling better. Athletes want to compete. So they may not be as truthful with the coach as they should because they're fearful that they may not get the opportunity to compete. So to summarize and conclude, in this field we have this 
I, I think it's rather confusing terminology. I didn't develop it. But overreaching, overtraining, and overtraining syndrome. But what you probably need to think of is overtraining as part of the terminology. This is bad. It's too much training load. The other end of the continuum, normal overload is appropriate. Oh, sorry. There are signs and symptoms that can tell you someone has the overtraining syndrome. We know that the causality is an imbalance where there's too much training stress and too much life stress that is not able to be compensated for. You as providers need to have awareness but recognize that once the symptoms show it may be too late. And again, all the information from this presentation really revolves around these three particular research articles. And this last one is one of mine. And if you contact me for the slides and you would like a copy, I'm glad to send this article to you. So with that, muchas gracias, I thank you, and if there are questions, I'm glad to try to answer. athletes okay uh, so yes yeah Paralympics and such you know that is a great question uh, but I have no experience in working with handicap or Paralympic uh, style athletes so I, I don't even know the literature so I, I have to say that is something I I can't give you a good answer to mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. And I know, uh, you know, and just leisure reading about some of the Paralympic competitions, because I, I find it fascinating to read about the sporting events. There are real issues sometimes with uh, things such as depression because they are in chronic pain and the pain medications maybe deal with the pain but then prevent them from training. So they are not taking medication so they can train but then when they take the medication they can't train and so they are emotionally being pulled back and forth as to what to do. Sí, dice que a veces en el caso, por ejemplo, que muchos, eh, muchas, 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 eh,
toda la meditación para el dolor, de repente esto no puede ser. O sea, sí, pues lo que hay una cuarta de cortisol, porque joven y cortisol, y después otra vez lo que está. Entonces, si no toma la meditación para entrenar, And if, with respect to doping, uh, Paralympic athletes are held to the same standards as uh, more able-bodied athletes, but Paralympic athletes, because of their needs for medications, many, many times will get therapeutic use exemption, so they can use certain drugs that are on the banned list. <laughs> pero como de repente por condición médica puede tener que tomar sí, no que claro antes de tomar <coughs> So, you, yes, you, you'll find people who have the overtraining syndrome have higher levels of injuries. Some of those are musculoskeletal, uh, uh, some of them are other varieties, but yes, they do seem to go, uh, we would say, hand in hand that you're going to have those injuries. Why? So, um, you want to translate that? Yeah, yeah, and then I'll... <laughs> Yeah. So, for example, one of the things you find is with inflammation, you alter some of the aspects of the structure of the skeletal muscle fiber cell. And in that case, it becomes torn trauma to it much easier. Certain of the cytokines that get released with inflammation actually affect your vestibular area, your balance. So a movement that normally an athlete could perform very easily, cutting and turning while playing football, they may suddenly fall down and have an increased injury risk. Yeah. In order to prevent uh, overtraining syndrome, this, this RPE or scale or something. Oh, the RPE. Okay, I thought you said epi. I was like, epinephrine? No. <laughs> um, so I was actually talking with Carlos earlier today. There are two researchers, Dr. Carl Foster and Dr. Ann Schneider. And one of the biomarkers they suggest can be looked at is the ratio of blood lactate to RPE response to a standard exercise load. Entonces una, en este asociaban en un test de, de esfuerzo escalonado de, de máximo por una cinta o una cinta como sea mi, mi, midiendo la carta si no muestra la carta según el protocolo dos minutos dos minutos dos minutos y medir la carta la carta la carta y correlacionarlo o sea y medir al mismo tiempo sí. la sensación subjetiva de esfuerzo al otro por ejemplo 
And what they have said is if you calculate that ratio and the ratio is going down, that may be an indicator that the overreaching is becoming too much of a overtraining. I, I think that's an interesting and simple biomarker and they proposed it and researched it easily 10 years ago but for some reason you there hasn't been a lot of additional work on that so if you need if research study that's a great nice biomarker that needs more information because I, I think it has potential but the, the, I, I've talked to Dr. Foster and, and Snyder about this one of the things they say is you can't tell your athlete what you're doing because they will always lie about the RPE then and never give you an accurate answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Una más? Cosa más pregunta? Si no estamos. Okay. Gracias. Están ahí todavía si tienen alguna pregunta y quieren hacer. Y si no, bueno, estaríamos este, terminando. No. Okay. Bueno, entonces, una pregunta. Gracias.